Ahí va a llegar el gol del Arsenal Ophil. Marca Mesut Ophil. Bellerín, otro defensor, otro disparo, Monreal, gol. Marca el futbolista español, marca Nacho Monreal. Pim, pam, pum. This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. James, as is now a new tradition, goodly evening to you. Goodly evening to you too. Uh, how's your weekend been? Better, uh, g- good, I guess, because Arsenal won. Well, this is exactly it. You know, the measure of a weekend is whether or not Arsenal have won, and we have won, and also we have kept a clean sheet at long oh. last. Our sheet is clean. Pristine. You could hang it up there like, I don't know where you'd, where would you hang a sheet? On the washing line, I guess. On a washing line, I guess, yeah. yeah. Out the window, if you were trying to escape. True. Or if you were giving up, if you were saying, I surrender, you'd hang a sheet out the window. But But our sheet... Just make sure it's clean if you're going to put it out the window, for God's sake. Yeah, our sheet is not a sheet of uh, surrender. It is a sheet of of cleanliness. And uh, how good was it to actually keep a clean sheet? Because I was a little bit worried at the end when they got that free kick. Right at the end, they were going to put the ball in the box, and I was thinking, yeah, you know, we're going to win this game. I know that, but it would it would take something away from it if we were to concede a, another late goal. But thankfully, we didn't, and that's uh, that's bucking the trend in a way. It is bucking the trend. I mean, after Thursday night, you know, where we were in complete control of that game and suddenly conceded two almost out of nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, anything seemed possible. But it's been a while coming. How many games have we played this season? Seven, something like that. Yeah, this is our this is our seventh game, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. So we've we've had to wait for it. Petr Cech particularly has had to wait for it, but he uh, he definitely deserved it today. I mean, it, you know, a lot of it was down to him. He earned it in a big way, didn't he? I mean, I think he was he was our man of the match in the first half, and even though I thought we were a lot better in the second half, he still had work to do, and he did uh, everything you could, you could want from a goalkeeper. He made saves. He dominated his area. I really enjoyed the bit late on where uh, Cross came in or it was a corner or whatever it was. And he just came out and he punched it away. I think it was the second one he punched away in quick succession. And he took out Mustafi. And I'm not saying that's why I enjoyed it. I just want to make that clear. And he took out the... the the Who did we play? What were they called? What's their name? Everton. Everton. Yes. That's it. I was thinking Hull. And it's not Hull at all. But... Uh, um, yeah, he took the two of them out and got the ball away to safety. And I think there was there was a lot to like about his his performance today. And uh, I was very happy for him that that he managed to uh, to come away with a clean sheet. He really did deserve it. Yeah, and uh, I think you know Emery will be very mightily relieved as well. I mean, it, it was it's strange, isn't it? It was a two nil game, but and we won. But they had more shots on target than us. We had the same amount of attempts. Mm. Uh, and I think that speaks to how clinical we were with the two chances that we took and how good Czech was, really. Yeah, it really does. And it is, of course, the... Well, how would you say? And not the cloud to our silver lining, but, you know, it's hard to look at that first half and not, be, not still be a little bit worried about what's going on because the first half really wasn't that great. We might touch on a few bits and pieces, but just let's talk about the... The team selection, the lineup, Mm -hmm. a a first start for Lucas Torreira in midfield. I think we've all been uh, itching to see that. Uh, And then Aubameyang and Lacazette up front, Ramsey and Ozil uh, as the other part of that. What I I would class as kind of like a front four. It's not really Mm. like a front two or a front three. We have these four uh, attacking players. And uh, there's a little observation I'll make a bit later on, which I would like to get your opinion on. But... Uh, any issues with you with the team selection? Was there any surprise? There was no surprise, really. I mean, I, I, I felt that Torreira would probably start, you know, it felt like he'd been easing him in and then he started in midweek and he, he didn't play the whole game. So that felt like, you know, it was finally going to be, you know, I almost can't bring myself to say it, but time for Torreira. <laughs> um, beyond that, no. I mean, I Aubameyang obviously played through the middle in the Europa League, but was back out on the left today. No, I think everything else was kind of as I expected, but I mean, the performance wasn't, you know, we were really poor, I thought, in the first half. Everton will be ruining that they didn't take those chances because obviously that would have really changed the complexion of the game. Mm. But we we were vulnerable defensively to their 
speed and trickery and wide areas. Um, and going forward, I mean, you spoke about that front four. Much like at Newcastle, there was just no real cohesion. We didn't see anything from them. Really. Yeah, it's really strange because if you go and you look at the stats, which is what I did and what I do after every game, you look at the stats and you look at some of the player stats. You know, with players like Mesut Ozil, Aaron Ramsey, really comfortable on the ball. Forwards, as a general rule, will make less passes than than your midfielders. But we've got Ozil and Ramsey, who are two very, very good, very technical footballers. And when you look at the amount of passes that they make in a game, it's it's far below what you would expect. Like, how often? I know mm. Granit Xhaka is the guy over the last couple of years who's dominated possession for Arsenal. But Mesut Ozil has always been pretty close to him in terms of the amount of touches he has, the amount of passes he makes, the amount of chances he creates. And we're not seeing him involved as much as he has been in the past. Ramsey's role, I'm not quite sure how to define it, but, you know, you look at the the, the passing statistics, I think Mesut Ozil, he, what, 38 passes in total. He only made 79% of those. Aaron Ramsey, 30 passes. You go back, it's Torreira, 64. Granit Xhaka, 101. You know, um, Rob Holding, who came on uh, as a uh, as a substitute, made more passes, more successful passes than, than Mesut Ozil. So there's something weird in the way that this team is organized. I can't quite... I don't know if everything links up as well as it should, or if yeah. it's a case, and I know that we've we've had questions about this, but we might raise it now. When you play Ramsey and Ozil, do you do you, do they kind of cancel each other out in a way? Maybe. I mean, one thing I uh, the point about Ozil is really interesting. Uh, you know, because he is someone who has racked up huge numbers of completed passes in a game. You know, where he's been kind of. Uh, linking the play, mm. orchestrating things, sometimes even dropping deep to do that. We yeah. saw quite a lot last season that he would almost drop back into the midfield. Ramsey, I'm not sure I consider Ramsey um, as ball dominant a player. And I think okay, Emery yeah, yeah, doesn't fair. see him yeah. like that either. Like I think, I think that with Ramsey, what Emery's attempting to do is kind of shift his role to something a bit more akin to the kind of it's not a name I even like saying, but Deli Ali. Yeah. So someone who is like a second striker almost and is like a pressing agent. Now, the problem is, looking at the, the stats from the game, Ramsey, not only did he not make very many passes, but he didn't really offer a huge amount defensively. Zero tackles, zero interceptions, you know, zero blocks. So he was real, really a, a bit of a passenger in this match. It's interesting um, that Ozil actually got four tackles. Four tackles, game. yeah. He made more tackles than any other Arsenal player. He, himself and Nacho Monreal both yeah. made four successful tackles. And, you know, I think we have to look at the definition of a tackle because uh, there was a couple where he just kind of kicked the ball away from a guy, and that's fine. I don't think we <laughs> we won the ball from those tackles. You know, if you're thinking a, a Socrates slide and, and come away with the ball kind of thing, it wasn't mm. that, you know, but... Um, yeah, I do. The take numbers your- would suggest that, it, that I guess he is doing, you know, some of that defensive shift. But with Ramsey, you know, I'm not sure. I think Emery's looking at Ramsey and thinking, I don't think he's the guy I want in my deep midfield. I, you know, I, I don't mm. regard him as that uh, sort of metronomic player. But Özil normally absolutely is. The other thing I thought about the front four is that it felt today very lopsided in the first half because you had uh, Lacazette playing up top then you had Aubameyang on the left and it felt to me like Ramsey and Ozil were both drawn to that left flank as well actually like there was times where Ramsey's position was more to the left than central yeah. and it just I've not looked at you know a I've not maps. seen yet like a heat map type thing but it felt in the first half like it was very concentrated on that left hand side and look there have been some great Arsenal teams that have been asymmetrical or lopsided you know if you think of the Invincibles they had that kind of bias but it's weird with this team it feels like it's sort of ad hoc for every game you know we we saw uh, was it the West Ham match and we had so much joy down the right hand side with Bellerin and Mkhitaryan that's since been discarded and we've started trying to make this other thing work and it, it isn't quite and actually in the second half one of the things I did notice that was that Ozil whether by his own intuition or by instruction, was more adhering to the right-hand side and had a bit more combination play with yeah. with Bellerin. And I think we looked more balanced. But in the first half, it, it really was a mess. And I, 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is ever going to work. The chemistry just doesn't seem quite right. But which chemistry are you talking about here? The the Ozil Ramsey chemistry or the front four chemistry? You know, I don't. I'm talking think... about the four, the four, the four way. Yeah. yeah, because obviously the chemistry between Lacazette and Aubameyang appears pretty good. Well, I mean, it is. It's good, but like, does it does? Do you not come away from games thinking Aubameyang is is kind of is kind of isolated or he's He's inhibited by the role he's being asked to play. I think Jamie mm. Carragher said something on Sky Sports afterwards. You know, you've got two top strikers like that. Ultimately, if you're just playing one up front, one of them is going to have to play wide. And perhaps uh, Aubameyang is better suited to playing wide than, than Lacazette. And they're both scoring. So can you really say it's a problem? But you can't look at the way that he's playing and think this is the, this is the best way to get the best out of Aubameyang. You know, it's a really yeah. tricky situation for, for Unai Emery because Lacazette really showed his value. I thought he was quite quiet, but then the ball comes into him, Ramsey plays him the ball, and, and what an absolutely fantastic finish. You know, out of nowhere, on a day where we needed some uh, extra bit of quality, he was the guy to, to provide that. So, you know, as it stands, Aubameyang has scored from the left, Lacazette scored from a central striking position, Emery will be reasonably happy with that, but I'm not sure that that, I agree with you that the chemistry is not right between that front four, that it seems to be missing an ingredient, whether it's someone like Mkhitaryan or whether it's somebody like Iwobi, in place of either Ramsey or Ozil, maybe that's the, maybe that's the, the road we have to go down. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible not to watch uh, Lacazette and Aubameyang play and think, I'd, I would love to see that as a conventional front two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure we're all thinking that watching this because, you know, they do have that rapport and they're very different strikers. I mean, they're an ideal combination. You've got someone who's willing to come short and can link things and you've got someone who's devastating in behind. I mean... It seems like a no-brainer, but for Emery, it would mean a departure from the system that he's used for the vast majority of his career. And, you know, maybe that's not a departure he's prepared to make. Um, one thing I sort of came away from the game wondering was just to jump forward a bit. You know, at nil-nil, Alex Awobi was stood on the sideline, stripped off, ready to come on. And I'd, I wasn't in a position to see what was on the board or what have you, but I yeah. would love to know who of those front four... Emery was thinking about withdrawing, you know, who he considered dispensable in that moment. It would have been quite a telling, I think. But yeah. as it happened, like I said, stuck it in the top corner and uh, we went from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, OK, so first half was worrying from a defensive point of view. It wasn't particularly cohesive mm. from an attacking point of view. What was your takeaway from that first period was there a real positive that you took from it I mean I have to say I enjoyed Lucas Torreira I thought uh, he looks very very comfortable um, obviously Petr Cech we, we've spoken about but in terms of our outfield players I think Torreira was the guy who really who stood out for me and we've talked about well is he the guy who's going to get the best out of Granit Xhaka you know we, we don't know that yet there's still a way to go we've got to see them play together a bit more often but you know he picked up a booking but he managed his game very well after that he did. I, I feared for him a little bit when he got the book in. Especially fact, with John Moss. Yeah. Someone said to me that he was maybe a bit fortunate. I, I haven't seen many replays because I was in the stands, but uh, that there was maybe an instant where he went in for a second challenge that got missed by the referee. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you've you seen players sent off for that in the past. And right. I don't think the Everton player did him any favours. Uh, it was the left-back, I think, Digne. Um, oh, yeah. I, you know, I think he he basically exaggerated the 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 contact to try and get Torreira sent off. To be honest, because he knew he right. was on a yellow card, it wasn't the kind of foul that would leave a guy crumpled in a heap on the floor. It was you know it was an honest attempt to get to the ball. I mean, my heart was a little bit in my mouth, but mm. uh, you know, fair play to to the referee. I suppose he didn't buy it or either that, or he didn't see it properly. So. I thought Torreira was good. I mean, his first moment in the game, I think it was in like the first 30 seconds of the match, uh, he kind of out-muscled Richarlison and showed, you know, a bit of physicality and tenacity. I thought he was, yeah, I thought he was one of the positives from the first half, but there weren't many. I mean, I was chatting to mates at the ground at half time, and the mood was very flat and the atmosphere yeah. was very flat, yeah. actually. People were, you know, a little bit... Uh, fed up, but there was also that uh, that sort of chink of light at the end of the tunnel because you know something that was 
people were saying, and that has proved to be true, is, well, we have been much better in second halves than we have been in first halves. Well, we have, uh, we have you know, the second part of the show is the, the part for the questions, but mm. we have a slew of questions basically saying, why are we so bad in the first half of games? Mm. Have you any idea? I mean, I can't quite figure it out. You know, we have been, I think, significantly better in the second half of games uh, than we have been in the first. I mean, we've we've found it hard to get going. We've found it hard to find our rhythm. We, we talk about, you know, uh, the halftime changes that he's made and that by any, uh, by any way you want to look at it is tacit admission from the manager that this is not going the way I wanted it to go. So I'm going to change something at halftime. And it's worked for him. You know, in fairness, it has worked for him. But... We don't seem to be able to to start games as well as we would like. I mean, the first 10 minutes today at home against Everton, you want to get the crowd going, you want to get the team going, you want to put a bit of, you know, a spark into the occasion. And we were on the back foot. We were completely on the back foot for the opening 10 minutes. Yeah. I mean, the, the most positive uh, reading is that we have a manager who can affect change in the course of a game. But I don't think that answers why we're not coming out of the blocks like that. Mm. Um, and for you know the people playing sort of James catchphrase bingo at home, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really difficult to discern. The only thing I can think is maybe it's unfamiliarity with, with the tactical ideas they're being asked to implement. So there's, you know, that little bit of caution. I mean, someone might say a bit of handbrake almost in the yeah. way that we start games. Yeah. Dare we say? Uh, it? Yeah, um, because it, it is a pattern and we do tend to come out in the second half and be be much more, I don't know, more, more direct, more, we looked almost more energised in this game after, in the second period. Um, and, and I, yeah, I can't explain it. I can't explain it at this point. Do, have you got a, a guess? Mm, no, not really. I, I wonder... I just wonder if the fact that teams come to play us and know that if they press us that we're a bit vulnerable, we're a bit um, shaky at the back. And I wonder if the team are well aware of that as well, that they, they as soon as we get into, um, you, you know, as soon as you get pressed or as soon as a mistake may, is made, you know, the one with Xhaka, for example, where he got caught yeah. in possession. I don't think it was a good pass to him in that position, but, you know you immediately kind of retreat back into your shell a little bit. It's hard to express yourself and to be attacking and everything else when you're concentrating so hard on not conceding or or not uh, allowing space in behind. And I do, I think maybe unfamiliarity is a, is an issue where we're, we're, we're still trying to get used to the way that, that Emery wants us to play. But I, you know, at the same time, you know, he's not really asking them to do anything extraordinary. You know, he's not asking them to do a backflip every time you make a pass. You know, it's it's just, uh, it's fairly simple stuff. Okay, playing out from the back might not be everybody's uh, cup of tea, but it is literally just passing the ball from one footballer to another. Mm. Um, I, I think as well we have a tendency in the first half of games to be a bit cautious to go backwards when we could go forwards, you know? Um, was there a moment when Socrates made a great breakup field after a corner and we, we yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden we turn back? Now, maybe he didn't have any options, but maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe he needs options in a situation like that. You know, that there is this um, inbuilt caution into the way that we're playing that that is slightly inhibiting in the first half of games, and then you go in at halftime, and everyone's going, "Come on, guys, we got to do, we got to do better than this. We got to take the game to them. We've got to be a bit more confident. We've got to be be a bit more assertive, you know." Which we were, I think, in the second half. But maybe it's just a, a question of time and this team getting to know each other better. But um, that's my best guess. I don't know though. I think I think you make a good point about our defensive vulnerability and frailty and and how that's often exposed quite early in games. I think that makes it difficult for us to sort of take the initiative and be on the front foot. You know, it's like we're constantly having to worry about what's happening at the back in a way that maybe inhibits us a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's it is an issue, but we are churning out the results. I mean, that is the good news. We are at least now gathering some kind of momentum and maybe that will give the team the confidence it needs to actually play 
from kickoff for once. Yeah, I mean, is that not the sign of a good team to be able to grind out wins when you're not playing well, etc., etc.? Yeah, uh, maybe that old one. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that's uh, that's the case, but you can't argue with the results. The results have been, the results have been good. Um, you know, we 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 can have our concerns, but second half, then okay, we're better. We are better, even though I think Everton started the second half better than we did. They were a mm. bit more. Um, they're a bit more on the ball, um, but individual quality is what we've got in attack. Even if those four pieces aren't quite working in harmony yet, all four of those players are capable of moments which can change games. And that was the case with with the first goal. Um, it was Lucas Torreira who hooked the ball out of the sky, kept it alive, put it yep. back to Aaron Ramsey. Aaron Ramsey into the path of Lacazette. And Lacazette, the finish was unerring. They were showing it again on Sky where he didn't even look up. He knew exactly where he was. The finish was was superb. It was. It was a breathtaking hit from Lacazette. I mean, the way he strikes the ball... It's so sweet, isn't he it? I mean, really hits it, doesn't he? When he gets it yeah. right, he really hits it. Yeah, I mean, think of the Cardiff goal by way of example. I mean, that was mm. fantastic, and this was another one. I think, in terms of uh, you know pure striking of the ball, I think he's as good as you know anything we've had in the last few years. I really do. He just he's got a wonderful ability to. I mean, if you watch the goal again, it's not just uh, the finish, but the first touch sets it up so perfectly. He's got such good. Uh, you know, such a good close control in those situations. He's a great penalty box player. And I think he's doing terrifically well. I mean, you know, this Lacazette is a very different Lacazette, I feel, to the one that we saw last season. He looks he looks much more acclimatised to the Premier League. And maybe that shouldn't be a great surprise no. after 12 months. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. I'd, I'd take slight issue with what you say about his... I mean, I think his touch for the goal was absolutely fantastic, but I can think of a number of occasions this season where I think his touch in the box has been poor, where it's let him down, where he's made the wrong decision. There was a moment, I think, in the first half where Ramsey played the ball back to him and he took a touch rather than hit it first time mm. and the ball got away from him. So, you know, when he gets it right, he really does get it right. There's no question. But I do think uh, at times that's an area of his game which could still... Uh, be improved a little bit and I don't know how much you can improve that part of your game at, at 27 years of age or whatever he is but that's to take nothing away from from his goal and then the second goal it looked like we'd managed to fuck it up um, yeah, it really did it really did uh, but have you watched the replay again uh, I have actually yeah I have seen it it's, um, it's a really on. amazing piece of quick thinking and quick feet from Aaron Ramsey because yeah. when he goes to the ball he slips and he immediately changes what he was going to do because he was going to hit the ball and you know he's there and he's going to uh, try and finish but as he slips you can see him thinking and in one movement flicks the ball behind him to to Lacazette it's very deliberate it wasn't accidental or anything like that um, a really really clever piece of play from Ramsey yeah, and we know that he's a great instinctive player. I mean, think of that goal he scored, was it in the Europa League last season, where he adjusted his body and, you know, flicked the ball over the players the keeper's head yeah. with the back of his heel. I mean, he's, he's, he is capable of those remarkable moments. I mean, it was offside, wasn't it, the goal? But, uh, yeah, by a no, long way. I mean, I mean, how? By a long way. How is, uh, that, how is that even possible? It's not, it's not even marginal. I don't know. How can the, the linesman see that or not how can he not see that he's offside I don't get it I mean I'm not complaining it's so clear it's so clear because all the defenders are effectively out of the game right I mean it's just mad that he missed it yeah. but of course uh, I haven't got a problem with that I mean that's an interesting thing about Rams isn't it that I sort of said <laughs> 15 minutes ago that he was a bit of a passenger in the game he wasn't really involved wasn't playing any passes but two to assists play two final balls <laughs> Yeah. I was going to take you up on that at the time, but I thought we'd, we'd you get thought into you'd save it. it. I thought well, I'd save it. Till I've you... owned up to it at this point, at least. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, it. it's that is one of the interesting things, isn't it? I mean, it, I, I, I can't really get my head around it, but there you go. There you go. Look, two assists for Aaron Ramsey. It wasn't his best game by any stretch of the imagination, but at the end of the day, he's provided two assists, two goals, which have got us the, the three points. And I think what was... For me, the most pleasing part of the game, 
um, aside from the result, obviously, in taking the, the three points, was the way in the immediate aftermath of the, the second goal, and probably until around the 80th or the 85th minute, we controlled the game really well. I thought mm. I thought that was a really positive sign of of what the team is is capable of. They'd obviously had a bit of a discussion after the the game in midweek about uh, you know letting in those late goals and and staying focused and staying concentrated, even though we have a a, a reasonable lead in the game. That was really pleasing to me, and it, you know I'm not saying it was incredible football I don't think it was uh, you know something that we need to write uh, hymns about that will be sung through the ages or anything like that but it was just good professional solid measured controlled football which which uh, it went a long way I think to help us win the game because you know if you're 2-0 down uh, and we've seen it in the past with this Arsenal side not just doing I Emery's but uh, you know in, in the years gone by where we might let a goal in fairly easy or, or shortly afterwards, and all of a sudden the whole dynamic changes. Your two goal lead is down to a one goal lead. You're on the back foot. You're shitting your pants. You know we mm. we've seen that, and I think what was really interesting is that we didn't allow Everton to make any kind of comeback. You know, I know Czech had a, a few moments here and there, but that you know that was as much down to you know his dominance. Um, quashed whatever little bit of attacking quality Everton had when they got there. But it was good to see, I think, that we were able to to just put our foot on the ball, slow it down, and just stop Everton building any any kind of momentum or staging any kind of comeback. You know, they made a couple of changes and they made fuck all difference. Yeah. And I think that is something that Emery does bring and will bring you know I, I think at, at sometimes people might feel that he could be too conservative that's something we were warned about by people who had seen him in France or in Spain but you know he, it does appear he's at 2-0 he's sort of the type of coach who is content to at least try and see that out and his substitutions reflected that ultimately you know he brought on Welbeck and uh, Welbeck Welbeck and Iwobi who yeah. are while both attacking players are a little bit more positionally disciplined maybe than some of the other players we might have had on the field yeah. and, you know, have that physical edge as well. Um, so, yeah, it was it was relatively comfortable until those last few minutes. Like you, I was desperate for the clean sheet and had a horrible feeling we would somehow let that slip at the last minute. But uh, it's really nice to to have that under, under our belt. And... And without Socrates as well, who went off, of course, in the first half. Yeah, yeah, that was... Uh, they said a dead leg, but apparently it's a knee problem. I'm not quite sure what it is. I think it looked like he jarred his knee, yeah. Mm. I, I, I don't know how bad it was. I mean, he funny, he walked off the pitch looking for, sort of fine, didn't he? It didn't yeah. Look too, well, too I mean, shabby, there, there was a, the incident, wasn't there, with Mustafi, where Mustafi was left in a heap on the ground, and when they showed holding on the, uh, the touchline, I was sure it was going to be Mustafi who was Likewise. coming off. Yeah, yeah I, it seemed a, a dead cert. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, fingers crossed. It's uh, it's not too serious. It would be a blow to lose him because I think he is really growing into the team. There was a nice, uh, well, nice. I'm not sure if nice is the right word, but um, when he picked up the injury, it was for a foul on Theo Walcott. Yeah, the reason he had to make the foul was because Mustafi got caught on the ball, uh, bundled off it, and, and Walcott was heading into our box, and he took, you know, he made a, a what I would consider a good foul uh, in, in that position because uh, otherwise it could have been a bit more dangerous. But after um, the referee had set up the free kick, he came back across uh, into the box, into the defensive line, and he was saying something to Mustafi, which I'm not sure what it was. You'll, you'll see it on TV replays. But it was good to see him, you know, take a little issue with... Mustafi's mm. carelessness because I think that's what it is you know week in week out there are these moments of carelessness which uh, can prove costly whether it's a goal whether it's a guy getting a yellow card ultimately today that little moment uh, resulted in Socrates getting injured um, so you know it's it's good for uh, I think it's good for Mustafi to be let know that uh, you know he ne he needs to sharpen up, and I think in general today Mustafi was fine. He did pretty well. You know he mm. played uh, played pretty well throughout. Um, but when things like that happen, it's good that someone's telling him to just fucking sharpen up. And it was a it was the right decision, I think, to make the foul. I mean, you know, he brought him down right on the edge of the box when it looked like he was going to go through on goal. Yeah, I've I've got this sort of developing theory about Socrates because you know when we signed him. 
uh, people said, a lot of people who watch German football, I know Lewis Ambrose, and said, oh, he had a terrible season last year. You know, he was making mistakes all the time, uh, high profile errors. And he's such a cynical player. I wonder if like, because you know, they introduced VAR in uh, German football last year. <laughs> Do you think that's why he was suddenly having a nightmare because he couldn't get away with all his little tricks? I, we need to keep VAR out of the Premier League if he's going to thrive. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much of uh, how much of what he did wrong last season was down to VAR or whether it was yellow cards or red cards that were the issue yeah. with him. You know, I think it could have just been it could have just been mistakes. So I, I was a bit uh, sorry to see him go off today, to be honest, because uh, you know we, we've we've seen some good performances from him in the last couple of weeks but you know we still conceded two goals against uh, Vorsklaat we conceded two goals against Cardiff we conceded a late goal against Newcastle we conceded goals in every game this season so Mm. I think it would have been nice for him to be part of a clean sheet and I was also just curious to see uh, you know could he replicate that kind of performance against better players Uh, Mm. I I noticed that Richarlison never went anywhere near him he stuck to yeah. Bellerin and Mustafi. He wasn't going anywhere near uh, Socrates at all. Um, and I, th- I thought I thought uh, Rob Holding did did well when he came on as well. But it just illustrates a little bit, doesn't it, how how precarious our central defensive situation is, in the yeah. sense that if Socrates picks up an injury, we basically got two senior centre halves, and Mavropanos is out with a groin injury at the moment. Uh, you know, we don't really have a, a great deal of depth there until Lauren Koscielny comes back, and there that that comes obviously with a big caveat of how how physically ready or able Koscielny is going to be after such a big injury. Mm. I mean, I was about to say, yeah, I mean, eyebrows were raised when Callum Chambers was allowed to leave on loan. I don't think it was so much eyebrows being raised as keyboards being smashed. People were were not happy about it. And that's probably why, isn't it? Because, you know, we're, we're you know, an injury away from, not if not a crisis, certainly a, a bit of a perilous situation. Um, I don't think anyone... You know, as much as we like holding uh, and we like what we've seen of Mavropanos, you know, we, we you wouldn't want to be going into Premier League games with such an inexperienced pair at the back. No, true. But I wouldn't mind seeing holding alongside Socrates for, mm, a, well, for a game or two. I, I liked what holding did today and I liked what he, uh, what he did for the most part on uh, Thursday. So... Yeah, I wouldn't be against that either. Uh, I don't know how likely it is, but Holding's a good passer of the ball as well. That's one of the things people talk up about Mustafa. You know, he plays those sort of punchy passes into midfield. But I think Holding's uh, he, he had I think one or two slightly dodgy ones today. But for the most part, I think he's pretty technically accomplished. He is. He's capable. I do wonder sometimes if he plays within himself because he's got this slightly in, uh, insecure role within the squad. You know, he's not a, mm. necessarily a. a a first team player week in week out so when you're that kind of player you you tend to play it a bit safe at times um mm-hmm. you know there were moments last season when he played um under Arsene Wenger where you know he, he got a few of them wrong going forward but uh, you know I like to see a center half uh at least be a little bit adventurous but you know that's uh, that's something we'll see I'm sure on Wednesday he'll play against Brentford in the uh in the Carabao Cup um but today obviously a, a good day for us three points and we're into sixth place James we're level on points with Tottenham oh that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, just one behind Watford, uh, who are in fourth place. Uh, Liverpool leading the way on 18, City on 16. So, you know, after that dodgy start, well, I mean, I don't even know if you can call it a dodgy start to the season, can you? When you lose against uh, Man City and you lose against Chelsea, you know, it, it's not really a disaster. It's not like losing to teams in the bottom half of the table. They're two very good opponents, and it was a difficult start to the season. But, you know, to have come back with four wins in a row, uh, I think is a, is a credit to the team. I mean, I'm still, I'm still sort of in the dark about what exactly we're doing and how we're trying to do it. But, mm. uh, you know, you can't argue with the results. No, I mean, it's, and it's what for next week, isn't it, at the Emirates Stadium? So we've got an opportunity to to leapfrog them there and get ourselves into that pack, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's frustrating in some ways that we dropped the points we did against Chelsea. When you yeah. look back, that was a real chance, wasn't it, to, to take something off them there, um, and we didn't manage it. But since then, 
uh, as we said if, just a few minutes ago, you cannot argue with the the results. We spoke about this as being a winnable run of games, and to be honest, not just a winnable run of games, a run of games where we had to take a lot of points if we're serious about Champions League qualification. And so far, we are doing that. Yeah. Um, I, I had I couldn't let part one go by without asking how you found the emotional reunion with your favourite player Theo Walcott. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is the second one, so it doesn't it didn't even register. You know, we've uh, we've done this before because he mm. put, he was part of the Everton side that got beaten five one, I think five one was it? It would have been five one at uh, at the Emirates not long oh, after he joined. That. Yeah, I've exactly. You know, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't the first time he seemed to get a bit of a black eye. Did he have that coming into the game, or was that? I think it was during the game. It yeah. was during the game. I don't know quite how it happened. I mean, he was Maybe fairly. Someone just left it on him somewhere. Yeah. somewhere along the line. Yeah, look, you know, I don't really hold any ill will towards Theo Walcott or anything like that. But uh, there was a moment where in the live blog I had to type Walcott Walcott loses it or Walcott dispossessed or Walcott does something. And it was just like, how many times have I written that in <laughs> yeah. my life? And just now, like old times. <laughs> <laughs> and now it doesn't matter. Now it's actually a good thing that he doesn't. So uh, there, was a, there was a bit of a funny moment where he had the ball on the right flank in the first half and he just sort of, it was a bit of a, you know, a Theo moment where he kind of dribbled just off the pitch. You know, he just dribbled it out of touch <laughs> and a little charm went up and like, Theo, Theo, Theo. It was just one of those sort of quite funny <laughs> moments with like, the fans acknowledging him uh, and and reminiscing about uh, the good old days. It was a very Theo performance, really. It was quite dangerous. You know, he got in behind quite a few times, but Ooh, didn't... Uh, yeah really make the most of it. Well, I mean, how many times have we seen him score from the position he was in when he Mm. got through? We've seen him score plenty of goals in that position in the past. And, uh, you know, Czech came out and made a good save, I think. So, uh, you know, we kind of got away with one a little bit there. So um, It's Petr Cech's day, really, isn't it? Because there was so much intrigue about we're going to get this look at Bernd Leno and it's on Thursday and it's a real riposte from Cech today. I mean, he really asserted his credentials and he's got that number one shirt and he yeah. he's obviously going to fight for it. Well, as you said last week, he hasn't put a hand wrong all season. He has not put a hand wrong. He That's true. That, that wrong. is no, true. No, it's absolutely true. I think he has been one of our best players so far this season. I know he's had those moments on the ball and everything else, but I think he really has been one of our one of our better performers, you know, when it comes to the job that he's actually um being asked to do and that's keep goal uh, I think he's been pretty good so look will we leave it there for part one or have you got anything else is there anything else you want to uh, touch on probably just how much I'm enjoying the whole uh, sort of circus at Manchester United I, sh- I should mention that really I mean it, it rumbles on a draw with Wolves and I've noticed that they're really unhappy with Alexis now the United oh, fans oh really are they yeah, 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 yeah. They're absolutely fuming. I uh, saw a, a, a great tweet, actually. I retweeted it, I think, on my timeline from a United fan. Let's see if I can just quickly dig Yes, it please. Um, Let's enjoy this. It said, what was it? Oh, it was from the, at the Man United way. Uh, and they say, quite shocked at the form of Alexis Sanchez. I think people are forgetting the calibre of player he is, but he just looks completely lost out there continuously running nowhere and making some really poor choices in his passing. <laughs> Arsenal fans will be laughing at us. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't I don't harbour any ill will towards Alexis Sanchez either, but you can't not be amused at the five... What's he earning there? 470 grand a I week, mean, something... Nearly a half million pound a week. Astonishing yeah. amount of money. And you know what? I think, in hindsight, you know, maybe he'll prove us wrong. Maybe he'll prove us wrong. He'll spark back into life. But I do think that we probably got the best years of Alexis Sanchez at Arsenal. Oh, yeah. And we and we bled him dry in that respect. Oh, you know, we, we absolutely we... knackered him. He's like one of those <laughs> old horses, isn't he? He's just fucking... <laughs> <laughs> we just take him down and boil him down for glue now. Um, yeah. Well, look, if it makes Mourinho unhappy, anything that makes Mourinho unhappy, as we all know, is a very good thing. I mean, yeah, and it, I am sort of shocked. I was expecting kind of Van Persie Mark II when he went there. You know, it felt inevitable it would go that way. But I know that, you know, his last six months at Arsenal weren't the best, but I think he's been considerably worse than that at United. So yeah. long may it continue. What's he got, three goals or something since he's gone there? Yeah, I hope, you know, for his sake, that 
pay packet isn't done on goal bonuses because, you know, he'll be going hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Him and his dogs will be going hungry. Uh, <laughs> anyway, look, we'll see. Uh, undoubtedly, he'll spark back into life when we face United at some point. But, you know, that's a bridge we can cross when we come to it. All right, we'll uh, end part one there. We'll come back with part two right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter, at Gunnerblog and at Arseblog. Did I say Twitter really funny there? Were you listening? I think, I don't know. I, I wasn't paying enough attention, to be honest. No, you were just, this is the bit you just t- switch off for. Says this every week, I can't yeah. hear. But anyway, if I did say Twitter funny, anyway, uh, at Gunnerblog and at Arseblog, and again, because we're doing it on a Sunday evening, I forgot to do it on Facebook. Sorry, Facebook people, I will uh, make sure to post it next week. I promise. I promise. Just to remind you that you can get extra content, extra articles, and lots of other good stuff on the Arseblog Patreon. If you want to sign up and be a member, it costs just a fiver a month so if you like what we do here on Arsblog you can help support that by becoming an Arsblog member on Patreon go to patreon.com forward slash Arsblog it's a fiver a month and you get lots of uh, lots of good stuff we've got some uh, some good stuff coming this week some new stuff coming this week so uh, so uh, feel free to join up if you haven't already right questions James questions mm. 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 have you got one or do you want me to have one I don't know what I want I've I've got one Okay. I've got one. So, uh, this one comes from Afro Arsenal at Afro Arsenal. And they ask, is Iwobi deserving of more game time in the league? Performed well when in the Open League and the team looked decidedly more balanced when he came on today. Um, maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I like what I've seen from Iwobi so far this season he seems quite determined to make a mark uh, you know he had those issues last season didn't he when he was out he stayed out a little bit late and maybe people think okay he's not as uh, he's not as dedicated as he should be and maybe he wasn't maybe it's a lesson that he learned from uh, and under a new manager he spoke last week didn't he after the, 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 the game on Thursday about how much harder everyone's working under Unai Emery he seems to be really enjoying that hard work uh, I, I thought he was quite lively today when he came on. There was one moment where he, he went chasing around the pitch, didn't he? And he got a big yeah. sort of round of applause because people appreciated the, 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 the pressing and the harrying. You know, he's stronger. He looks stronger. Um, he's huge. He's absolutely huge. I can't. I mean, I know, we spoke about it in pre-season, I know, but it is it's such a dramatic transformation. Uh, I, I think it is anyway. I don't know if I'm sort of imagining it, but every time I see him in the flesh, I'm like... This guy's like doubled in size. I thought that when I saw him in in Dublin in the Dublin game when he came on, I was like, "Holy fuck! Mm. What the you're like? What? You know, I'm <laughs> you're not I'm, Alex Awobi. You've you've eaten Alex Awobi. Yeah, it's like Alex. It's like he shed his skin to become like Super Awobi or something. I don't quite know. Uh, he, he's definitely. He's definitely physically, whether it's matured or developed or he's just got into the gym and he's doing all kinds of stuff in the gym, maybe that's what it is. It could be just hard work. Maybe he's knuckling down. He's doing his you know, his reps and his weights and all that kind of crack. But uh, look, I think he's going to be a very useful squad player for us. Whether he's quite at the level where he's going to be in the team for the Premier League week in, week out, I'm not quite sure he's there yet. But I don't think he's doing his chances any harm when he comes on and he has an impact and he can, you know, he looks like a guy who will, uh, what's the word I, I want to use here? He's he's uh, going to follow the instructions of the coach. You know, he yeah. can he can play a particular toe the line. role. I don't, yeah, I mean, toe the line sounds like, you know. Like as, he's as, a nerd. Yeah, like he's a nerd in the school, the, the 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 coach is a school guy. But I think, you know, he can be put on by Unai Emery. And Unai Emery, I think he's, okay, here's what I'm trying to say. He is the kind of player, I think, that would not thrive or reach his potential under Arsene Wenger's freeform jazz orchestra style. Right? right? The go out and express yourself style. I think it would work for him at times because he's got some real quality on the ball. He's got some nice moves. He's got a good shimmy. You know, from time to time it would work. But it feels to me like Iwobi is a player who, if he's really going to, uh, you know, uh, achieve his potential, it's going to be because he is being told what to do. He's being coached to improve. 
So go out there and do this, and in those circumstances, do this, and this is what I want you to do here. That you know, I think that I think it will really suit him to be coached by Unai Emery. So mm. that's that's where I am with that. And I think Unai Emery really likes him actually, um, because well, first of all, there was the new contract in the summer. Then he started him in the Chelsea game. I think he is using him plenty when he's mm. been available. And just watching today, I mean, obviously we don't know Emery well and it's difficult to, you can infer a bit too much from body language sometimes, but when Iwobi came on, I sort of had one eye on the player and one eye on the touchline and there were a few instances, uh, just small things, the way he held the ball or the way that he pressed in the final third that Emery responded really positively to from the touchline. And I do think... You know, when you look at this that front four or you look at the wide players in that system, I do think if you were trying to build a player who had the attributes to fit into Emery's ideal system, it won't be would have some of those attributes. Yeah. And he was the man who was going to come off the bench today at nil nil to try and make a difference. I don't know if that would have been the case had Henrik Mkhitaryan been available. But I think he's in a good position and with that long term contract. Uh, you know, I, I think he is going to be part of the plans moving forward. I'm not, I'm not saying let's start him. You know, every week from now on. But I think, as you say, he's going to be a useful squad player over this season for sure. And I think the manager, the coach rather, does seem to believe in him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, here is a question from Corey Chachere. I think I, I apologise if I haven't got that right, Corey. But he says, for all the talk of Emery prepping specifically for opponents. Have you noticed significant differences in our approach for each game? He says, genuine question as a tactic dumb fan. Hashtag Mm. ArsCast Extra. (laughs) Extra. Well, extra. I think I have noticed some differences. I mean, the the obvious one, the outlier is Man City, isn't it? Uh, Where it felt like we had played in a sort of tailored manner that was an attempt to counter, you know, the way they they operate with Ramsey as the spearhead and things like that. But beyond that, it it does get a little bit more difficult to discern the intricacies of it. I suppose, I mean, I suppose the introduction of Aubameyang for the card, uh, sorry, of Lacazette alongside Aubameyang for the Cardiff match, but I, I would be hard pushed to say I felt that was done specifically because of something about the Cardiff team. It was more that Lacazette had kind of shown himself to be important mm. in by coming off the yeah. bench and performing well. Isn't it more uh, a case that you would have to tailor your tactical approach to teams which are perhaps superior to you or who can cause you specific problems? Whereas, mm. you know, if you look with all due respect at Cardiff, at, uh, at Newcastle, at even Everton to an extent, you know, you know, they're a reasonable team. They've got some okay players. They can hurt you if you're not switched on, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, maybe when we face Liverpool and he does something with his team or his lineup or his formation that's designed to negate the qualities of their front three, maybe that's when we get a better judge of, of what it is he's trying to do or how flexible he is in that way. Yeah, and and similarly in the Chelsea game, I felt that there was a concerted attempt to kind of expose their fullbacks, particularly Alonso, who really bombs forward and leaves space in behind. And I felt we profited from that. So there have been little things. Today against Everton, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I felt like there was a bit less of the short interplay between centre-half and goalkeeper. And and fullback, I felt like Czech went longer more than he has done. Um... I don't know if the numbers will bear that out, but I wondered if that was because Everton's front line are so quick, Calvert-Lewin, Walcott, Richarlison, and maybe we just thought, well, we don't want to expose ourselves to that by, by you know, fucking around with it at the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, there have been little bits and pieces. I mean, one thing someone said to me at half-time today during the game, they were like, if you were watching this match um, and you didn't know that we'd change manager, would you be able to tell? Uh, Um, uh, It's a good question. I mean, I tell you, I probably could because Meza Ozil was out wide and Arsene Wenger was pretty reluctant to do that, wasn't he, for for the majority. I think that that would tell me something had uh, maybe shifted. Yeah, and we also had a defensive midfielder. 
Yes, there's that as well, yeah. (laughs) Um, But in terms of the style, it's not a dramatic change, is it? It's not a... Yet, I suppose is the important word there. Yeah, I, yeah, true. But I mean, how how dramatic can it be anyway? You know, people we had our issues with Arsene Wenger, and the results weren't great or anything like that. But fundamentally, Wenger tried to get us to play good football week in, week out. You know, he did it for twenty two years. You know, these were players who wanted the ball; they were comfortable in possession. He wanted to play attacking football. You know, what what do people actually want to be changed? Was the defence? was a bit more defensive awareness, a bit more defensive now, a bit more organization, a bit more structure. And those things are kind of boring, right? They're the boring parts of football, really. The guy bombing down the wing and beating two players and putting a cross in and the striker, you know, beautiful, intricate build-up play, triangles, all that kind of stuff. That's all stuff Wenger did down the years. So what we were lacking was the the kind of boring stuff, which is just being organized and tracking back and getting back into positions. And, you know, I, we're clearly a work in progress in that regard. So, you know, I don't know that ultimately when, when Emery, you know, gets his particular orchestra playing whatever tune it is he wants them to play, it's going to be that different from what Wenger did anyway. That's fair enough. And the, the personnel, you know, are predominantly the same, aren't they? I mean, yeah. with, the, with the defensive midfielder. Exactly. Um, this question is from Jenny or Jenny Heinonen, who's at Hippie 200. And they ask, what do you think the lineup's going to be against Brentford? Ooh, I think probably similar ish to the Europa League, but I suspect we'll have to be a bit more cautious with the senior players. Like, I know we've only got one left back, but I don't think we can play Monreal again, you know? I don't, right, yeah. I, you know, we, I, it would be crazy to play Monreal when he's the only left back we've got for the Premier League. Um, so let me, have a, let me have a little bit of a guess on this one. I think we're going to play uh, Leno again in goal. I think yeah, it'll be think Licksteiner. It'll, it'll be Holding. It'll be... Maybe it'll be Mustafi, but depends on the Mustafi injury. Maybe it'll be... Or it won't be Socrates if he's gone off with an injury. Or no, it could I think... Be and Maver- also Socrates played the Europa game, yeah. so I think... I think it'll be Mustafi yeah. and Holding. I'm not, I think Mavropanos would probably still be out. I don't left know what back. we're going to do about left back. I know that we were, I think George Bird, uh, who does the, mm. the Arsenal youth stuff on Arsblog News, uh, was talking about a young left back being brought into first team training. Uh, I can't remember his name though. Dominic Thompson, maybe. Um, so maybe we might have to blood a youngster at at left back in this particular game. And that will be quite exciting yeah. in its own way. So then I think we'll do Genduzi, Elneny, Iwobi, Welbeck. I think Nketiah will play, and I think maybe Smith Rowe could play this one. I right. don't know so that he's going to play. Maybe he might play like a Zep, but... I don't, I don't think know. he will. I don't think he will either. I think I think this is I think the he'll game. Play I think this is the game to to give Anketi a go, play well back in one of the wide positions, and uh, and that's what I think will be. Yeah, and I think maybe Smith Rowe, and it is Dominic Thompson, the name of that. Oh you know, wow! Back, so. Well remembered. Yeah, so that could be a, a big game for him. Brentford are going pretty well in the Championship. I think they're they're in the Championship. Six. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Brentford, Brentford aren't bad. Um, I just had, you know, you hear the name and you think immediately League Two or League One. Sorry, Brentford fans. If there's any Brentford fans listening to this, I haven't been paying a great deal of attention. Uh, They've got quite an interesting model, really, because I think they... Who who was their coach who then went to Rangers and didn't do very well? But, you know, they oh, sort of... Oh, uh, he was the guy who was linked with the director of football job with us. Yeah. 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 So they've been, they've, they've done, they've built the club quite effectively. And of course, this is getting potential revenge for their 2-1 behind closed doors victory over us in yeah. the summer. Yes, of course. Of course, they've done it. Mark Warburton 
is the guy. Yeah, that was Mark Warburton. Yeah. I'm just looking they've, at their squad good... here. Any names that stick out? Josh McEachern, he used to play for for Chelsea, Chelsea didn't he? Yeah. Swansea, Josh yeah. De Silva, of course, who is a former Arsenal player, a for a guy who could have been playing at left back in this particular game is now a uh, is now a Brentford player. So uh, that'll Nico be Nico Yanaris, another former Absolutely, uh, yeah. Arsenal player. He grew up at the club. He's uh, still a gooner, so yeah. It's going to be an interesting I feel like game. There's a third former Arsenal player there, but I can't remember who it is. Um because I remember that when when he joined Josta Silva, they were like, oh, he's joining. I mean, Josta Silva, ironically, would probably play this game. But I just said that. Back. You weren't listening to me. Were you listening to me at all? No. I genuinely that just said? said that. Yeah, literally 30 seconds ago. Oh, uh, I was Googling the Brentford squad. Sorry, mate. No, that's all right. That's all right. Great minds think alike, eh? That's exactly what it is. That is exactly what it is. It's not <laughs> just sheer, out there. Not sure, sheer indifference on your part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Okay. Over to you. Uh, uh, yeah, over to me. Hang on, I've got it here. This one comes from Robbo, who's at Clarky Robbo, and he says, "Is this Czech's best form since joining the Arsenal? Is it due to the Leno arrival? But he's had others fighting before. Is it a new manager or staff realizing it's now his career on the line? He's been great so far." I think it's probably a little bit of all those things. Um, without wishing to dodge the question, I do think that he. He, he has responded to the challenge of Leno really well. It would have been, it must it must be difficult. I always think as a footballer, I often think about that when the team buys someone in your position. Like yeah. you know what's happening there. You know you're not stupid. Uh, you know that it's going to be a problem for you potentially. You know that you're going to come under scrutiny. But that is, I guess, the advantage of his experience. I mean, check. He really has sort of done everything there is to do in the club game. Um, and well, internationally as well. I mean, huge amount of caps for the Czech Republic, and uh, that must stand you in good stead. You know, I mean, he's someone whose his confidence isn't easily shaken, and uh, I, I, I'm really pleased to see him having this run of form because also he seems like he's one of the good guys. You know, a bit like Per Mertesacker, really. yeah, someone who is an intelligent guy. I think he speaks something like five or six languages and quite uh, seemingly a nice guy and someone who's very respected in the dressing room. So I think I think that it's it's great. It's great for him. And to be frank, you know, Leno is 10 years younger than Czech. Uh, I'm sure his time will come. Frankly, I think it will probably come before the end of this season because you don't spend that much money on somebody for them to sit on the bench for too long. But for now, Czech's doing just great. Yeah, apparently he can speak seven languages. Whoa. Yeah. Which is amazing. So, um, yeah, no, he is. I, I've, I've, uh, you know, considering his his background and considering where he came from and everything else, uh, you know, I, I like him a lot more than I thought I was going to. You know, he mm. does seem like one of the good guys. I think what you have to look at this season as well. I think the challenge of a new guy certainly is playing a part. I think perhaps the fact that. Arsenal have gone out and spent twenty-two and a half million pounds on a goalkeeper. As a club, we've gone and done that, but Unai Emery has shown faith in Petr Cech. You know, I think that's a boost for him and a boost for his confidence. Mm. Uh, you know, True. he's got some. He's made him captain. You know, that's a real show of faith in him, and I think that's that's something that a player can respond to as well. It'll make, make you feel good, but also we have a new goalkeeping coach. I was about to say, yeah. You know, and I don't think we should underestimate the the impact that a new goalkeeping coach can have, particularly when they're replacing one whose work hasn't maybe been up to scratch or maybe as modern as it as it should have been. You know, this mm. guy, uh, Javi Garcia, worked with Lukas Fabianski at, at Swansea in his first season when he was at Swansea. And Fabianski spoke really, really highly of him. And part of the reason why Fabianski wanted to leave Arsenal was because he felt he wasn't getting the the coaching that he needed or that he wanted to develop as a, as a player. That was part of why he wanted to leave. And one of the Arsenal goalkeeping coaches went to Swansea, Tony Roberts, uh, and uh, that that's not the guy. It was Jerry Payton was the guy that was perhaps below par and had been part of Arsene Wenger's coaching staff for, for years and years, you know. Uh, but this new guy has come in, Javi Garcia. He's uh, apparently a very... 
Uh, he's got some good methods. He's got, you know, he's he's up to date with stuff that's going on in terms of coaching and coaching methods. And I think perhaps that's having a, an impact as well because we know that Czech, when he was at his best with uh, Arsenal or with Chelsea, he had his own goalkeeping coach there or the goalkeeping coach at Chelsea. Lolly Sean, is it? Lolly Sean, yeah, yeah, was somebody that he was very close to and worked very closely with. And, you know, as professional as you are, and Petr Cech is a great goalkeeper and has been a great goalkeeper down the years, you do need to be kept sharp. And you need to, you always need to be challenged as a professional player in order to maintain your level. Otherwise, you just, you know, you stagnate a bit. And would it be fair to say that last season Petr Cech's performances were were also a little bit below par? You know, yeah. in, in keeping with the whole team, by the way. I'm not like just everybody singing, else. Like exactly. everybody else. And now we've got new coaches and new coaching methods. And I think you can see perhaps that there are improvements, not just in Petr Cech, but in other players as well. I know somebody who's uh, come in for a bit of criticism down the down the uh, the last couple of months or certainly in the last year or so anyway is Hector Bellerin. And I think Hector Bellerin is quietly, quietly improving his defensive work while still being able to contribute going forward. And again, we have a situation today where most of that right flank is Hector Bellerin's to mm. attack down and to defend down as well. Uh, you know, he did get some help from, from Mesut Ozil, but, you know, it is kind of, it's his domain, this sort of patch of the Emirates Stadium down the right-hand side, whichever half we're playing in, that, that's his. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that with Hector Bellerin as well. Early days, but I think, it, you know, it is playing a part for him and for Czech. Yeah, I think on Bellerin, I mean, there was a moment in the first half where he went to take a throw in in the final third and he had to wait for about a minute for anyone to get within 30 yards of him <laughs> so he could shut the ball to them. I mean, he is really on his own out there, but I do think he's he's coping with that well and contributing at both ends. So, yeah, that, the point about the goalkeeping coach is a really good one. I'd forgotten that, actually. Um, and, you know... Maybe it isn't too late for an old dog to learn new tricks. Yeah. Or at least sharpen up some of his old ones. Exactly. Um, this question, oh, this is quite a funny question. Matthew Parry uh, said, the pod is very funny as it is, but surely it could be made funnier with alcohol. Any chance you could record one absolutely slammed, like that show Drunk History, but better. <laughs> Matthew, listen to the one we did in New York and all your dreams will come true. Uh, maybe, maybe we will do one, will we, at some point? Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, it'll be like the, uh, like the FIFA game. We'll, we'll get to it at some point. We'll have yeah, a few beers. We'll do it now. So, yeah, people will. We'll do it for the Patreon guys. <laughs> I th- we don't want that out there in the, in the wide world. I think maybe this is one that we might have to do face to face. You know, that's. Yeah, that's yeah. It, the, it'd be too tragic otherwise. <laughs> with the two of us sitting here with cans yeah. of fucking Dutch gold or whatever yeah. just sitting here going are you drunk enough yet I don't know I, I don't know, know. Is this what you want is fuck off you're always on my back about things yeah. um, <laughs> weeping weeping into our keyboards um, this question though um, from Daniel Williamson uh, I know you don't like to talk about Ivan but don't worry it's not really about Ivan <laughs> they say he says um, Gazidis' departure was a good opportunity for Josh Kroenke to take some sort of control. Is it a good thing that he was not mentioned in the reshuffle? Uh, what future do you see for Josh Kroenke and Arsenal? I think Josh is going to be involved, whether it's, uh, I spoke about this on the Arscast on Friday, whether it's official, like he's the CEO, or whether he becomes the chairman or the vice chairman or a special chairman or, you know, the super cronky on the board, I, I don't quite know. But my understanding of what's going on right now at Arsenal is that Josh Kroenke is going to be far more involved in the day-to-day running of the club. Now, whether he's, okay, maybe not day-to-day running of the club, but the executive decisions that the club will make. Uh, I right. think he's going to be a lot more involved in in those things. So we, you know, time will tell. The Cronky still haven't made it one hundred percent. They're going to be one hundred percent owners sooner rather than later. I'm not quite sure when the when the final raft of shares will be hoovered up into Stan's Texas Ranch and we become one hundred percent KSE owned. I don't know when that's happening. I presume as and when that happens, then the the Cronkies will start doing the things that they want to do, or Josh will be given the the license to do what he wants to do. I mean, the the the, the best scenario we have is that Josh Cronkie, as a a young man, relatively young man, um, 
sees Arsenal as a very high-profile way of enhancing his own reputation, you know, mm. as a sports director guy. He's involved with the Denver Nuggets, isn't he? He's like the chairman of he's Denver Nuggets. He's closely involved, yeah. Yeah, so that's his kind of thing, um, and I'm not sure how good or bad they are. Um, probably bad. Uh, <laughs> just from what I've seen, but I could be wrong here. My my knowledge of uh, American sports is really quite poor. But just from what we've heard down the years of the Denver Nuggets, it, it hasn't been great. But uh, things seem to be happening for the LA Rams, or you know, that's the the, the Cronky team as well. Mm. So maybe there is a desire on his part to kind of make a mark. And if he can make Arsenal a really competitive team again, that's got to reflect well on Josh Cronky. Question is, does he care? Does Josh Kroenke give a fuck whether he's perceived in a good way or a bad way? Does he want to be seen as a really effective, successful sports executive? Or do you give a fuck when you're getting paid millions and millions anyway and it doesn't make any difference? I mean, you know, that's, yeah. that's the other side of that. So We don't know. No. We don't know. But he cared enough to seemingly intervene to some extent towards the end of last season. Yes, that's true, actually. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we'll see what happens. Again, it's like it's like with Unai Emery, you know, it's six games in. We're not even uh, fully into the 100% KSE era yet. Uh, Gazidis is gone. Raul Sanyei is taking over. Raul and Vinny are going to run the club together. So... We'll just have to. We'll just have to wait and see. I mean, let me ask you: what What's your feeling about Gazidis going, and the way that it's played out? Um, I feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable with the fact that it did play out in the way it did, and that it took as long as it took to be dealt with. I'm sure there are reasons. I'm sure there are sort of contractual and legal reasons. Yeah. But I didn't like the. I didn't like that period of feeling a little bit like we were slightly held to ransom by a chief executive. You know, uh, that was an uncomfortable period. I, I, to be honest, I don't really... Give a fuck. Now, yeah, <laughs> I don't really care. I mean, the thing, I, I felt basically him leaving means he isn't the guy I hoped he was going to be. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, so he, at my most positive about him, I was in the summer, I was thinking, well, you know, he's built this set up for the future he's hired this coach he's hired this executive team but if he was someone who would walk away from that then he was never that guy yeah so you know it's like love isn't it if it's meant to be it'll be and it wasn't meant to be and and i and, and also i'm really impressed by uh raul i think he seems eminently qualified for the job and I sort of think we'll be fine. And, and and I actually welcome, I think I welcome Josh Conkey's involvement. I think that will do more, more good than just being passive and not, not being involved at all. Sure, look, exactly. You know, if the criticism of uh, Stan Kroenke was that he was silent Stan, then if Josh is going to be the guy, if he's going to be the Kroenke that we get, like, it's not Stan Kroenke and it's not going to be Bob Kroenke or Donald Kroenke or Eamon Kroenke or whatever Kroenke it is. It's going to be Josh. So is it better to have any kind of Kroenke than no Kroenke? I mean, we could argue that it would be better to have no Kroenkes at all, but we've got Kroenkes. That's the, that's the reality of life as an Arsenal fan right now. We've all got Kroenkes. Which sounds a bit like a itchy disease, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> you should see someone about that. Yeah, exactly. I've got terrible cronkies right there underneath the gooch. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, maybe that's a, maybe that is a positive thing that he's not prepared to to just sit silently the other side of the Atlantic. It would be good, and I, I spoke about this to Amy Lawrence on, on the podcast last Friday. You know, it would be good to hear from them. You know, not just in the in the offer document where they say we want to make Arsenal properly competitive in the Premier League and the Champions League for years to come. You know, we can all do that. Everyone can do that. It's like being, you know, an opposition politician. It's impossible not to say the right thing, you yeah. know. Uh, but it's, it's uh, and we talk about actions perhaps speaking louder than words, but it would be good to hear from the people who are now running this football club, who now own this football club in its entirety for the first time in any of our lives, 
one company or one man or one conglomerate, whatever you want to call it, owns Arsenal. And we haven't really heard anything from them. So I think it would be very useful to hear from them, uh, not just in a kind of stage-managed, friendly interview scenario, which Cronky has done a few times. You know, he's done it, I think, with uh, Jeremy Wilson in The Telegraph. Mm -hmm. He's given interviews, which again, you know, it's impossible not to say the right thing. It's like Ivan Gazidis always talking, always saying the right things, but actions speak louder than words, et cetera, et cetera. But let's hear from Josh and let's hear from Raul and let's hear from Vinny and let's, let's understand what the strategy is and let's understand what the ambition is. And let's understand why it is that they, they wanted to buy Arsenal 100%. Is it just for the book value, for the asset value, for the stadium, for the, the real estate, you know, for the broadcast money? Is that all it is? Or is there something more to what it is that they're trying to do? And I'd love to, I'd love to hear from them in an environment which, you know, it doesn't have to be hostile or anything like it, but it could be challenging, you know? Are you, are you inviting them on the podcast? Is Absolutely. That what, is that what this is? <laughs> yeah. Let's get Josh Cronky on the podcast. Josh, oh, if you're out there, if you're out there listening, Josh, we would be delighted to talk to you to find out, you know, your, your plans for this football club. Someone must know him on Twitter or something. They can send him our way. Someone surely. will let him know. Come some on, PR Josh. We're nice. Come we on, could just... do it. We're doing the drunk episode as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I agree, and I think oh, I include Raúl and, and Vinay in that. You know, it seemed towards the end of last season, across the summer, um, that the sort of executive leadership of the club were positioning themselves to be a little bit more vocal and a little bit more public facing in a way that they hadn't really been during Arsenal's reign. And 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 I thought that that was on the whole a positive move. And then I think in the last literally month or so, we had to really pull back from that because of all the Gazidis speculation. You know, suddenly it wasn't convenient really to have anybody out there chat yeah. about this stuff. But, you know, we've dealt with it now. And... Rao's there in the foreground, Vinay's there too. I think that they need to be a public presence, you know. I'm not saying they need to be sort of, you know, commenting on the coaches every move. Yeah. But it'd be just great to have some sense of the direction that we're yeah. headed. Leadership. I mean, would it not be fantastic to have somebody represent the club other than Sir Chips? Sure. You know, Sir Chips, who is an actual chip in David Squire's cartoons. That's where that's where we are with our chairman, you know, and, you know, he's I'm sure he's a perfectly nice man and everything else. But, you know, when Sir Chip says something, people just go, oh, whatever, whatever. Mm. Like, who give you know, who cares? He doesn't seem that nice, I'll be honest. <laughs> OK, fair but, enough. Um, Maybe he's not that nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I, I do think that I do think once the Crunkies have control of the club, you know, they must know that the image of the club has taken a little bit of a battering. And I think some to sort of, you know, borrow a bit of a corporate term, some more coherent and clear messaging, I think some, would actually really help. Some blue sky thinking. Some blue sky thinking. Some straight talking. No, no, I mean, it's true. I mean, if we have, like, somebody who is actually there and can can provide leadership at the time when the club really needs it, which is something that Ivan Gazidis did not do. He did not do it. You know, you can talk about all well and good about what he did, and he's, you know, you can give him credit for putting Raul and Sven and Unai Emery or whatever else. I mean, we, we know that the Unai Emery thing was not quite as cohesive as they made it out to be when they were talking about, like, how they appointed Unai Emery. And, you know, he's somebody whose career I've followed for many years now, and blah, blah, blah. You know, all this, you know, we wrote down three names. The three of us wrote down names, and number one was Unai Emery and all that. I mean, give me a fucking break. You know, the guy was nowhere to be seen when shit was hitting the fan last season like the f like literally shit was hitting all our fans and so much shit James there was sh fucking shit everywhere all there were kinds. no clean sheets there were no clean sheets you know there was all kinds of shit hitting all kinds of fans and Ivan Gazidis was nowhere nowhere mm. neither to that matter was Stan Kroenke or Sir Chips or anyone else you know they 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 let Arsene Wenger uh, who was um, subject to criticism for what he did in his job. Absolutely, 100%. There's no no question about that. But the level of it, the intensity of it, the, the relentlessness of it, 
and the isolation with which he faced that was not becoming a football club like Arsenal, in my opinion. So if we were to have somebody now who, when things go wrong, can come out and provide leadership that people actually believe, (laughs) maybe that would be a good thing for us. And I'm not saying necessarily that Josh Kroenke is that guy, but I don't know who else it's going to be. But we need to... We need to hear from them and we need to understand what it is that they're trying to do. And I don't mean they have to like tell us all the secrets where, you know, this is the way we operate. This is what we're going to do. These are our transfer plans. It's not that. It's a broader vision of what they have planned for the club and how they plan to operate it. That's 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 what we I really think we need that. And join us next week, where we'll be joined by Josh Kroenke. Uh, <laughs> we'll be pissed out we'll of our drunk. minds yeah. <laughs> on, on Lambrusco. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, look, um, yeah, that's where I am with that. I think I kind of went Stranger over. things. Stranger things. Okay, will we do one more just to finish? Yeah, go on, yeah. Okay, uh, this comes from Matt Limerick. Oh, there's one here that I meant to, to touch on. Uh, bollocks, where is it? I'm not really going to answer the question, but uh, the guy unlocked his Twitter account to ask it. So it's at MKM118. And he, his question was, Lacazette, has he put the curse of the the Arsenal number nine to bed? Uh, I think he has a bit. Too soon. It's too, too soon. Too I soon? Really? Yeah. Okay. I think he's on the way, though. I think he's on the way. But compare him to, like, the other number nines. I know. I mean, it's better like than Luke, Park. Better than Park, better than Lucas Perez. But was Podolsky a number nine? Podolski was number nine. Okay, so he wasn't that bad. Like, in Batista, comparison to Park and uh, Lucas Perez and, yeah, uh, yeah Baptista. That's, that's not a good one. Not a good one. Anyway, my question is, this one comes from Matt Limerick, who's at Matt 1608-2013. Uh, oh, oh, is that his birthday? Wow. He's really good at Twitter for somebody so young. Actually, that's extraordinary. It's amazing, but he says, uh, as an uh, as ex Norwich footballer Grant Holt wins a forty man Royal Rumble wrestling competition. I saw that. I saw really. The, I, I saw did. the clips of it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, he's got the like. Yeah, he's he's a big. He's got the frame for it. He's a big fat fuck, isn't he? Anyway, he says, which Arsenal player, ex or current, would you like to see get in the ring and why? Good question. Um, in the wrestling ring. Mm. I don't know. Who would be good? I mean, I'd quite like to see... My brain's just screaming Cazorla. What? I don't know why. It's because you're mental. <laughs> <laughs> I know who I, I would I think there would be something novelty about it. Be yeah, I mean, there would be. Who, who are you thinking? Well, I would like to see, like, I, I hearken back to the old days of the WWF, when it was yeah. the WWF, before they had to, you know, those pesky World Wildlife Fund people I made know, them change their damn name. Damn do-gooders. Yeah. And, you know, the the old days of, of wrestling, where they're all smashed up on, you know, huge steroids. amounts of steroids and drugs yeah. and painkillers and all that kind of stuff. I remember the there was the British Bulldogs. Do you remember those guys? Yeah, yeah. The British Bulldogs, yeah. Tag team, two brothers, or maybe they weren't brothers. They were just two guys with that kind of same vacant expression. Uh, Sure, sure. They They dressed the same. Dressed the same in pink underpants, whatever it was. I can't remember. You know, they're all oiled up and whatever. Uh, But I would like to see William Gallas in the wrestling ring against the British Bulldogs. Right. And the reason why I would like to see that is because I'd like to see them slam him into the ground. And then I'd like to see him sit on the ground and cry for something that actually he could sit on the ground and cry about. The prick. Finally, he'd be justified. Yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah? I think it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just Googling the British Bulldogs now and sort of, well, basically I'm just looking at pictures of oily men. That's what's happening, isn't it? <laughs> That's where I am now. Are they still alive, but, um, like, or or what? I don't know. Those steroids do terrible things to you. Oh, one of I them. Is, they are. Oh no, they're not. Uh, oh, the British boy. Okay, Davy Boy Smith Junior. No, okay, Davy Boy Smith. Was, okay, he's dead. 
He died. Last. I think, yeah, 2002. Myo, what did he die from? Myocardial infarction. Well, a heart attack. Oh. oh. Okay. So who was the other guy? Let me just look at the Google here. Dynamite Who's the other guy? Kid. Does he want to fight William Gallas? Davy Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid. He right. is he still he is he's alive and he's fifty nine years of age. So I don't think I necessarily want him to to fight William Gallas. Real name Thomas Billington. Right, right. I th- I think let's have fifty nine year old Thomas Billington fight William Gallas. I'm on to for the it. death. <laughs> <laughs> I know who'd win. I know who'd win. Mm. Wow, okay. Well, there you go. Or at least to the tears, to the tears. That's maybe more palatable. Right. And well, it's easier to make William Gallus cry. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So have you any further uh, thoughts on this, or shall we call it a night? Just maybe, like, do you remember The Undertaker? He was yeah. big, wasn't he? Maybe, like, see him against Mersaka. Like an extraordinary freak show. I'd like that. Yeah, I'm Two not sure Pearl would be men. a great wrestler, though, would he? I don't think you have to be when you're that tall. I think you just have to sort of pick people up and stuff, you know? Maybe we could get Santi Cazorla to wrestle Per Mertesacker. Maybe Santi Cazorla and Per Mertesacker could be like a tag team. That'd be amazing. Yeah. That, that would, would be, be amazing. Santi and, and Per Mertesacker. You know, Santi Cazorla could stand on... I'd love. You know what I'd love to do one day? Is get Santi Cazorla to stand on Per Mertesacker's shoulders... And we could get them a really long coat, mm. and it would look exactly like three little boys standing That's on top true. of each other's shoulders, trying to get or into one, the cinema. One very tall Santi Cazorla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad we stayed on for this. Oh, uh, me too. Me too. Look, we're we're getting a, we're we're going all kinds of amazing places. Josh Cronkey, Drunken Podcasts, and uh, Cazorla and Murtasacker Tag Team Wrestlers. You won't get it anywhere else. No, that's for sure. They're not doing this on Sky Sports. <laughs> right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you as ever for listening. Please, if you would be so kind, give us a rating or review on iTunes. We'd really like that. It pushes us uh, up the charts ahead of all those other, you know, um, better football podcasts. But, podcasts yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The ones that, that talk about stuff and things and what have you. But look, we are what we are. We do what we do. We hope you enjoyed it as ever. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.